Welcome to Rheumatology Highlights Report. I'm Dr. Lynn Calabrese from the R.J. Fazenmeyer Center for Clinical Immunology here at the Cleveland Clinic, welcoming you to our discussion of advances in basic science. You know, it's very difficult to keep up with all of our literature, and in the past, we've tried to highlight individual abstracts in the basic science world, but I thought I'd do something different today. I can think of no other area of greater translational interest than the development of small molecules to treat autoimmune and autoinflammatory diseases. And I'd like to take a few minutes with you this morning uh, to talk about these uh, molecules and the scientific rationale and background for their use. The molecules that we'll be talking today about are the JAKs. To get a high altitude perspective of this, we have to talk about kinase biology 101. It's been literally almost 50 years since Krebs and Fisher discovered that phosphorylation within muscle tissues led to uh, profound metabolic changes. And this uh, ultimately uh, led them to win the Nobel Prize. They described a family of molecules that were capable of phosphorylating proteins uh, that we refer to as kinases. The sum total of kinases within our genetic makeup we now refer to as the kinome. It represents 1.7% of the genome and at the present time, we know of 518 distinct kinases. The function is to transfer a phosphate group from ATP or GTP to a hydroxyl group on an amino acid, which results in changing structure and function. The amino acids that are primarily phosphorylated are either serine or threonine or tyrosine. Some kinases will phosphorylate um, uh, all of these, and they are known as dual-acting kinases. In this figure, I show a tree gram of the human kinome. Uh, this shows the structural diversity and interrelatedness between these uh, kinase molecules, and the significance of this will become clear at the end of our uh, discussion. Among the human kinases, I'd like to focus on those that are known as PTKs, or phosphotyrosine kinases. There are over 90 of these kinases that transfer their phosphate groups to tyrosine molecules, and these occur in two major types. Um, there is a family of these uh, PTKs that are intrinsically associated with the receptors of a variety of molecules, and particularly growth factors. Um, that means that when these receptors are triggered, uh, they will uh, in, uh, activate and engage their PTK activity. The second group are cytosolic tyrosine kinases. These circulate freely in the cytoplasm and associate with receptors that lack intrinsic kinase uh, capacity. There are over 32 members of the cytosolic tyrosine kinase um, uh, family uh, formed into nine subgroups. Within these subgroups are the JAKs, the SIX, uh, both of which you've probably heard of because of the molecules in late-stage development, um, as well as numerous other forms um, um, and subgroups. Now let's talk a little bit about the functional biology of these uh, molecules. Here is a diagram uh, of the structure of a typical um, cytosolic uh, uh, tyrosine kinase and this is a P38 MAP kinase. Here you can see the, the uh, substrate binding group. This is the substrate that will be bound to, to which the phosphate group will be transferred. Uh, the phosphate group um, will be taken from the ATP molecule located just superior to it. There are also other conserved regions known as hinge, the P loop, and the activation loop. And because there is conserved structure, this can be exploited to actually develop um, uh, molecular inhibitors. In this simple diagram, we see that a protein, the substrate, uh, which will be bound to the protein kinase, and then ATP will have its gamma phosphate or the terminal phosphate cleaved from it, and then it will be transferred um, uh, onto the hydroxyl group of the uh, substrate protein. 
One of the great developments in medical science in our generation um, was the introduction of imatinib to treat certain forms of chronic myelogenous leukemia. Uh, we have known for a number of years that certain forms of CML are associated with cr chromosomal abnormalities that have been dubbed the Philadelphia chromosome, a translocation uh, of chromosomal pieces uh, that resulted and marked a very serious form of leukemia. Um, in the molecular era, that Philadelphia chromosome was known to represent uh, an aberrant protein known as BCR ABL. ABL is a tyrosine kinase, which is translocated and annealed to the breakpoint region protein um, to form a constitutively active um, tyrosine kinase that does not occur in nature. And this uh, is a driving force of this uh, myeloproliferation. Uh, the substrate, uh, GRAB2, SHC, uh, would be uh, completely um, uh, 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 and persistently activated and phosphorylated, uh, leading um, to tumor production. A drug was developed through rational drug design known as imatimib. Uh, this was thought to be originally a highly specific inhibitor of this um, aberrant uh, tyrosine kinase. This was a, 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 a you know a very exciting concept because there were, the thinking was is that this kinase didn't occur in nature, so there would be little off-target um, damage going on, particularly since this was considered to be highly um, specific, and indeed it has transformed the management of that disease. Um, in this picture, we see BCR ABL and we see imatinib um, in the um, um, uh, binding groove, um, which inhibits its activity. Specificity, which thought originally to be a very favorable factor, uh, turned out to be serendipitously both uh, probably a, an Achilles heel, but also um, uh, a, a, a very favorable effect. And the reason is, is that imatinib had off-target kinase activity against several other tyrosine kinases, including um, EGRF, uh, which is expressed in a variety of tumors, including non-small cell lung cancer, certain pancreatic and colon cancers, and HER2, which has been found in breast. It also is active against some platelet-derived growth factor um, and others uh, growth factors seen in conditions such as nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. So it has been used in a wide variety of other diseases. In this diagram, we see the rich uh, integration of innate and adaptive immune uh, um, contributions to the pathogenesis um, of rheumatoid arthritis. And we have been selectively picking off varying cytokines in cells, such as B-cell inhibitors, T-cell inhibitors, cytokine inhibitors, in an effort to quench um, this uh, aberrant inflammatory activity occurring systemically and particularly within the joint. This diagram shows that these cells, these immunocytes and cells uh, of adaptive and um, innate immunity, sense the environment uh, through their cognate receptors on the cell surface for a variety of these cytokines. But from there, that signal has to be transmitted to the nucleus for a transcriptional program to make proteins to lead to proliferation, differentiation, and effector function. There are certain hubs of these intracellular messages um, that are being transmitted um, through varying key pathways. Here we see the JAX, the NF-kappa B, the MAP kinase pathway, the SICK pathway. These are just a few of the pathways um, that link the outside environment of the cell to the um, uh, nuclear transcription programs leading to um, varying uh, 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 cellular metabolic functions. Let's now focus on the family of JAX because this is the pro, uh, program that I think is furthest along. Um, on the top, we see the typical molecular structure of the JAK family. There are four, JAK1, 2, and 3, and a molecule known as TIC2. They all are structurally homologous. Uh, at the C-terminus end, you can see the two 
um, kinase regions. That's why it's called Janus kinase, the two-headed kinase. One is an active kinase, one is a pseudokinase and a regulator. On the N-terminus end, uh, we have um, uh, uh, a number of other regulatory sites and a binding site, um, and these are structurally conserved. Um, the JAKs function to transmit uh, a signal to the nucleus um, from type 1 and type 2 cytokine receptors, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, are responsible for uh, over 40 different cytokines. The first thing that we should ask ourselves when we see a new biologic um, or immunomodulator is, it, is, are there any tools in the immunology toolbox uh, that can give us um, a notion of any cautionary signals? And the toolbox has two very strong um, uh, pieces of equipment in it. One are preclinical models of knockout mice or transgenic mice, which may tell us something about the functional biology. And the other uh, is, are there any primary immunodeficiency diseases where these molecules are uh, defective and um, uh, which might give us some information? So on this um, uh, slide, I show the, uh, the uh, equipment in the immunology toolbox looking at um, knockouts. Uh, if we knock out JAK1 uh, from uh, uh, an animal, it is perinatally lethal. Uh, and this probably has to do uh, uh, because it's profound effects on inhibiting cytokines. JAK2, as I'll show you in a, uh, a moment, is intimately linked to hemopoietic growth factors. And these animals uh, do not survive, and this is embryonically lethal. JAK3, we have the strongest clinical signal that this is a, a very important molecule. And that uh, uh, comes from uh, studies of children with severe combined immunodeficiencies where uh, mutations within JAK3, many different mutations, are accountable for 25 to 35% of children uh, with this profound immunodeficiency. TIC2 has its own phenotypic appearance, um, perturbing response to certain pathogens. If we ask ourselves, um, uh, what do these JAKs actually sense, you can see that they are linked to a variety of uh, uh, cytokines. I'm only showing you a handful on this slide, um, but there are actually over 40 cytokines uh, that use JAKs to transmit their signals. We have the whole IL-2 family, um, uh, uh, of molecules, they share a common gamma chain that includes molecules such as uh, um, IL-2, uh, 7, 9, 15, and 21. We have uh, type 2 uh, interferons um, uh, shown uh, which use uh, other JAKs, IL-6 and the GP-130 signaling uh, molecules um, uh, use JAKs, as well as IL-12 and IL-23, which are tied to type TH1 and TH17. Uh, responses. And finally, JAK2 um, uh, being rather unique because they homodimerize and are uh, primarily responsible for hemopoietic growth factors. Uh, I'm sure that you're aware that um, uh, perturbations within JAK2 are a clinical marker of diseases such as myelofibrosis and uh, polycythemia vera. Also note from these, uh, this slide that in addition to the broad functions that the JAK serve, they uh, work in pairs. So if you inhibit JAK1, you'll affect JAK3. And if you inhibit uh, JAK2, you'll uh, uh, affect um, uh, JAK1. Uh, and, and this is important in designing drugs. This uh, complicated chart tells us that multiple cytokine families signal through combinations of JAKs um, and STATs, which we'll come to in a minute. Um, these are involved in uh, immunosuppression, immunomodulation, and anti-inflammatory activities. So it's a really different concept than inhibiting TNF or IL-6, which are like laser-guided uh, missiles uh, affecting just one part of um, the integrated immune response. Inhibiting uh, a JAK will inhibit multiple cytokines in one broad stroke. 
Now, this slide, uh, which is called The Seven Steps of Cytokine Signaling, uh, I have uh, borrowed from Dr. John O'Shea from the National Institutes of Health, one of the leading uh, cytokine biologists in the world and uh, uh, a man who has made great contributions to our understanding. Um, upon cytokine triggering of one of these type 1 or type 2 cytokine uh, receptors, this could be interferon or IL-6, um, uh, nothing would happen because the tail of the cytokine receptor does not have intrinsic uh, signal transduction capabilities. But once the structural changes occur because of uh, re a cytokine binding, uh, the jacks uh, then aggregate um, and are activated, um, leading to their uh, tyrosine kinase activity. They will phosphorylate the tails of the receptors, they will autophosphorylate, and then proteins that have the capability of binding to phosphorylated tyrosines will then bind to them. They also, uh, in their active form, will um, phosphorylate another family of cytosolic molecules known as the STATs. Um, these stats bind to the receptors um, uh, uh, and are phosphorylated. They dimerize, and they are transmitted, um, uh, translocated to the uh, nucleus uh, where they bind to DNA and regulate the transcription of whatever uh, the programs are um, that are linked to that particular cytokine. Obviously, IL-6 um, uh, will lead to CRP production and other uh, uh, members of the acute phase reactants, uh, while interferons uh, will regulate a different program of, uh, of uh, um, resultant uh, proteins. So here we see the uh, historical progression of how we have uh, managed uh, in autoinflammatory and autoimmune diseases. Um, uh, the uh, the original uh, uh, non -tradition, uh, traditional DMARDs, non biologic DMARDs, were empirical. They weren't even designed uh, to treat autoimmune and inflammatory diseases. We borrowed them from uh, mostly from infectious diseases, um, and we did not understand the mechanisms of action. Um, but in the biologic era, um, we have honed in on individual. Um, uh, links within the chain of adaptive and innate immunity. Uh, the era that we are in now are actually targeting uh, cytokine pathways. We're going for the hubs of multiple cytokines, trying to uh, balance risk and benefit um, in uh, the development of new molecules. Preclinical models have already told us that in um, uh, diseases such as collagen-induced arthritis, uh, using um, a, 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 a JAK inhibitor such as tofacitinib, uh, we can uh, turn off a, a bone destructive cap, uh, capacity um, uh, and ameliorate arthritis. So this has given us strong grounds to move ahead into clinical development programs. There are several candidate JAK inhibitors in clinical trials, uh, including uh, tofacitinib, INCB280050, uh, and VX509. Uh, tofacitinib appears to be in the, the most advanced stages of clinical development, and filing may occur within a year. Um, uh, candidate diseases include rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, IBD, psoriatic arthritis, transplantation, et cetera. Now, this um, uh, side of the kinome uh, binding maps uh, makes us think of the original kinase map. So each one of these represent the human kinome, and the red blobs um, uh, are the uh, kinase inhibiting uh, activity uh, of an individual candidate drug or compound. Um, Starosporin is a kind of a pan kinase inhibitor, as you can see, it has profound effects on every limb of the tree of the kinome. Um, imatinib, uh, fourth uh, from the left, was uh, the drug that has uh, originally used to treat um, uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia because it was thought to be specific for BCR able. But as you can see, other kinases are inhibited. And as a result, that's why it's been used in 
certain other forms of tumors. Um, we have other molecules uh, moving down the pike, um, including um, uh, molecules that are in candidate uh, therapy for uh, rheumatoid arthritis and autoimmune diseases, um, such as CP69550 um, uh, and VX680 on here, uh, which you can see have multiple uh, uh, kinase inhibiting properties. So we should not be surprised to see some off uh, target effects. Um, example, uh, the best example is JAK2 inhibition. Any molecule that will inhibit JAK2 may have some significant hematologic effects, such as lowered hemoglobin, white count, or platelets, um, but that remains to be to see. Finally, the risks and benefits. The benefits of this type of approach include multiple targets, um, um, uh, which uh, may have uh, favorable uh, uh, effects on efficacy. These will be oral drugs. They are oral drugs. So this is we're moving away from injectables, and I think patients will favor that. And they have very short half-lives, um, which means that stopping them may lead to uh, reversibility. The risks are off-target kinase effects and the untoward effects of immunosuppression. And uh, we should be learning and trying to avoid um, problems that we have uh, gleaned through using the immunology toolbox. We also don't know how durable these will be in, in the long run and how they will compare to drugs that, like such as TNF inhibitors that we've had over 10 years. Now, for all of you that have listened to this, I want you to go to Dr. Vivica Strand's um, rheumatology highlights report where she picks up right from here and gives you the latest information on the clinical development program of these molecules presented at recent international meetings um, uh, for you to take in. So this is a one-two punch. We also have 15 other rheumatology highlights reports, 15 minutes in the span of a canceled patient or a little break at lunch over a few weeks period of time. You can come totally up to speed as to what's happening um, as of this point in time. Six months from now, we're going to come back at you with another total re-update on a totally uh, different set of data. Uh, thank you for coming to Rheumatology Highlights Report. Come back and come back often.